Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the seventh FTC hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. I've been told I have about an hour and a half for these introductory remarks. No, I'm just kidding. Um, don't, don't worry, don't worry. I won't take nearly that long. Um, but let me welcome you. I think this is these are an incredibly important series of events. We have fantastic panelists who have really important and interesting things to say, uh, and I think it's going to help us create a record that will be very useful for a long time to come. <laughs> Let me start by giving a couple of quick disclaimers. First, um, everything I say today in this brief introductory speech will be only my personal remarks, not necessarily the views of the Federal Trade Commission or any commissioner. Um, and let me also, by the way, thank Howard for hosting this event. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and parenthetically, if there are any students who come into the audience or are watching or listen to any of this and you're thinking about careers in antitrust, uh, I encourage that. Think about it hard. It is a great career, and uh, call me. Uh, the other disclaimer I wanted to give is, for those of you who were not sure what those giant apparatus in the back were, they are cameras. Um, this event is being photographed and webcast. It will be posted to the FTC website, and by participating in the event, you consent to these terms. So I'm just, just to be clear, if anybody does not want to be on camera, now is the time to make your quick exit. Um, I thought I would start by just briefly talking about the purpose of the hearings. Why are we doing hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century? And why are we doing hearings on artificial intelligence? I know that Professor, Ga Professor Gavel spoke about this, and I wanted to echo the educational purpose, the importance of the educational purpose of these hearings. Um, at the Federal Trade Commission, we are very much in study and learning mode on the issues of antitrust and its application to modern and developing technologies. We think debate and discussion is critical, central to the advancement of knowledge and understanding and the development of good competition policy in these areas. We recognize that we and probably everybody in the world have a lot to learn about these topics, a lot to think about, and it's we think incredibly important to bring together thought leaders and experts on these issues so that we can have the kind of debate that will inform our decision making. Facts are critical, understanding is critical. When you're developing regulatory or enforcement philosophies, it's vital that you have a robust foundation in fact and a robust foundation in theory. And so as we began the process of putting hearings together as, as we started looking around the landscape of the antitrust world these days, one of the things that was immediately apparent was there was an awful lot of discussion, but there was not a collection of thinking, a collection of fact, a collection of theory that would enable the development of policy on the kind of foundation that I talked about. So recognizing that, that gap, I guess, in the underpinnings of enforcement Chairman Simons thought one way to address this, and Bilal obviously played a huge role in putting this together, was to convene hearings of this sort, hearings similar to those that Chairman Potofsky put together. Now let me turn from that to algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning more specifically. To say that there's a robust debate about the role that these rapidly advancing technologies play in society at large in our everyday lives and in antitrust enforcement would greatly understate the issue. Uh, I, I actually spend a lot of time reading about this. I will confess to understanding almost nothing about it because the technologies are so sophisticated, but I, I read a lot about it. Um, a few days ago, the New York Times quoted Facebook's founder as stating that in the next five to 10 years, Facebook will develop artificial intelligence that outperforms humans in all human senses, including cognition. Data scientists at Google have made similar projections, and if you read Sapiens, a book that came out recently, you'll find at the end of it a discussion about whether or not humanity is on a path to replacing itself uh, with some form of artificial intelligence, which has, of course, long been speculated about in science fiction, notably in Terminator, um, which we don't think is a huge issue right at this moment, but maybe the next set of hearings down the road, you know, 20, 30 years from now. Um, there's, of course, a lot of skepticism about this. And one of the things I found about artificial intelligence, I spoke um, at a conference in Brussels uh, about a year ago, maybe 13 months ago, and there was a great deal of discussion among lawyers about the implications of artificial intelligence and, al and algorithms 
And I discovered from talking about them that I think there was literally no one in the room who understood anything about how those technologies worked or what their actual capabilities were. Uh, and in the course of that, one of the panelists referenced a paper that had been written actually by Kaiyui Kuhn and his co-author, uh, Professor Tadellis, that talked about empirical work on artificial intelligence and what algorithms and in artificial intelligence were actually capable of doing at the time, which was considerably in tension with the views of the lawyers about what it can do, which frankly I think were largely informed by Terminator. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me reemphasized the importance of actually developing a foundation and understanding of what these technologies can do. And with that, I'm gonna turn a little bit to some discussion of the technologies and their implications. Now, when I talk about these technologies, I'm gonna use the term technologies broadly, or I might use algorithms, but I mean by it to group algorithms, artificial intelligence, and machine learning together. I recognize that doing that is inaccurate. These are not the same things. They're, they arguably represent points on a continuum of machine learning or machine approaches to solving problems. But there's actually very considerable differences between machine learning and simple algorithms, between artificial intelligence and different kinds of artificial intelligence. And they may have different implications for policy. Uh, but for the purposes of today's brief remarks, I'm not going to try to delve into those differences. I'm going to treat them sort of monolithically. Um, we heard yesterday at the hearings about companies and experts involved in the technological side of this about how some of these technologies are used in the marketplace, what some of them do, what some consumer protection implications of these issues are. Today we're going to talk more about competition policy. The first panel today is going to talk about whether algorithms can collude or might be able to do so in the future. We're going to have another panel that's going to talk about competition, innovation, and market structure questions that revolve around the use of these technologies. And then we're going to have a panel that wraps up that talks about legal and regulatory issues going forward. Now, these are hot issues around the world. I think I obviously get a lot of literature or bulletins on upcoming conferences, and I think it would be fair to say that 95% of upcoming competition law conferences involve, at least in part, panels on algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and technological implications for antitrust policy. We, being the United States Antitrust Agency, submitted a paper to the OECD Competition Committee last year that provides an overview and discussion of some of our thinking on these topics, uh, and in particular on algorithms and collusion. But we also noted in that paper that consumers have benefited a lot from these advances in technology, not just because they drive economic growth, but because they provide low-cost services, they provide higher quality goods and services, more choices and innovative new products. So, is this a one-way street? Are these technologies merely beneficial? Is there really any basis for any particular competition policy concern? Clearly, there is. Despite the benefits these technologies can bring to consumers, it's easy to see at least possibilities in which competitive dynamics could be put into play by the technologies. Let me talk about a couple specific examples. Number one, is it possible that machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, could actually collude by itself. So imagine that you have, and algorithms I think won't suffice for this, but imagine that I have artificial intelligence where I have machines that are engaging in cognition in some sense, I mean leaving aside the almost metaphys metaphysical question of what cognition actually means, but is it possible that machines could collude in the sense of explicitly agreeing on price, output, customer allocation, market allocation? And if so, what does that mean for antitrust policy? Can you put a machine in jail, for example? Second, and I think arguably of much more shorter terms, much more short term significance, is it possible for machines to reach the oligopoly outcomes more quickly or more sustainably than humans can? And let me, let me just digress for one second on that. One of the foundational principles of merger policy is that we want to prevent mergers that result in firms acquiring the ability to achieve an oligopoly outcome in price or output. And what I mean by that is in a non-cooperative oligopoly, you could nevertheless have a situation arise where output is reduced or prices is increased towards the cartel outcome or towards the monopoly outcome because 
relatively small numbers of firms can, can reach the conclusion that it is in all of their interests to restrict output or raise price, uh, and that the cumulative effect of doing so is beneficial to all. So the, the payoff is, is good, uh, in essence, if you collude without colluding. And this does not involve direct communication. It doesn't involve meeting in the back rooms of restaurants in New York, uh, like the book publishers did, for example, in the eBooks case. It uh, doesn't involve the kind of thing that you could put, be put in jail for. So this is a big concern of merger policy because once a merger occurs that creates this kind of condition, there's not much we can do about it. Section 1 of the Sherman Act doesn't reach it anymore. So we spend a lot of time thinking about mergers that will enable that outcome to occur so we can prevent it. So a question is, well, can algorithms collude in this sense, in the sense of independently and without communicating with each other, reaching a price raising or output reducing outcome better than humans can. A third possibility is could machine intelligence, algorithms, technology achieve or cement market power by enabling unilateral strategies to acquire, for example, or to destroy competitors before they become a threat? Is it possible that the use of sophisticated technology to survey the landscape and to monitor activity will enable dominant firms to identify threats and extinguish them before they become real threats in some way that is superior to what humans currently could do? And if so, what do we do about it? And I'll come back to that last point in a second. Uh, and then, of course, there's other, right? There's a broad category here of things that could happen that we don't really know about. Could, for example, algorithms in improve price discrimination? Price discrimination is not necessarily a bad thing. In a lot of contexts, it's welfare enhancing, but also it has some other implications. So I think also when you think about all these issues, you then have to say to yourself, and, and if so, let's assume any of these things is possible, what will we do about it? And let me just tackle the non-cooperative oligopoly outcome point briefly in this. Let's assume that it was in fact possible for algorithms to independently determined that the best outcome for each of their independent firms was a pricing or output strategy that caused prices to rise or output to fall towards a monopoly type outcome or a cartel outcome. But each algorithm is simply implementing the most rational economic choice for the company that it's, that's using it at any given time. Is our solution for that to require companies to program their algorithms to behave irrationally, to make bad decisions? Is that really a logical consequence of antitrust policy? Is it a necessary consequence? I raise that not because I think that's actually the right outcome or the right set of choices that we would have, but simply to suggest that it's not enough to identify potential problems, but you also have to think about what are possible solutions and what are the implications of those solutions, assuming the problem even exists. Now, fundamentally, at this stage, this is an early, early stage in the development of these technologies. I have in my pocket here two iPhones because I've got the government-issued phone and my personal phone. This technology is basically about 10 years old. It's ubiquitous, a smartphone that is. Uh, it makes use of a series of other technologies which are in many cases less than 10 years old. It's really difficult to see where all this is going to go in the next 10, 20 years. We don't even fully understand it today. And that, in fact, is the purpose of this, this panel and the series of panels and the hearings that we're doing in this to determine, as best we can, are these technologies likely to sharpen competition, reduce competition, or do both or neither? And if so, how do we address these issues? I think also one last point on this. There is some real grounds for caution here. We want to be very careful not to regulate or enforce without the kind of empirical, factual, and theoretical framework that I mentioned earlier. Ignorance is not a path to wise policy. I've heard suggestions occasionally that we don't really understand technology, we don't understand artificial intelligence, we don't know what it's going to do, and therefore we should regulate it. That may be so in the sector or regulator context, but I think it's terrible competition policy. For competition policy, what we need and what we have historically emphasized, and this is a point that Bill Kovacic, a former chair at the FTC made, and I'll circle back to this in a second, is we have tried to do the R&D first to figure out the issues first and then develop policy on that kind of foundation. And that parenthetically is an incremental process. We're always learning and always trying to improve what we do. 
but we don't act before we have some understanding. Bill called it the R&D of competition policy as part of the DNA of what we do in antitrust. I think it's critically important. That is what these hearings are all about. And on that, let me thank all of our, on that note, let me thank our panelists in advance. Let me say that I think the, the as I said at the beginning, the record that this is gonna generate will provide the foundation for the policies that we need to consider in the future. And I'm very grateful to everybody for making the time to be here today. Thank you. Great, Bruce, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, much appreciated uh, way to get us started. Now we're gonna start our panel discussion on algorithmic collusion. Good morning, everyone, and thanks again for being here. My name is James Rillinger. I'm a deputy assistant director in the Mergers Two Division at the FTC's Bureau of Competition. Uh, my co-moderator is Ellen Conley, an attorney advisor in the Office of Policy Planning at the FTC. We wanna welcome you to our panel we have a very accomplished group of panelists here today. Bruce referenced the r robust debate going on in this area, and I think we've got the right group of, group of folks to cover that with you. Um, there are more detailed bios online, but just very briefly, starting next to Ellen, we have Maurice Stuckey, who is a professor at the University of Tennessee College of Law and co-founder of the law firm, the Concurrence Group. He's also a senior fellow at the American Antitrust Institute and on the board of the Institute for Consumer Antitrust Studies. Maurice advises governments, law firms, consumer groups, and multinationals on competition and privacy issues. Next, we have Ai Deng. Dr. Deng is a principal at Bates White, an adjunct faculty member at John Hopkins University, and an invited expert for the Romanian National Council for Scientific Research. He has over a decade of experience in litigation, business counseling and academic research, and he has worked on some of the largest price fixing and market manipulation cases of the past decade. His current re research interest focuses on the intersection between technologies and antitrust. Then we have Kai Uwe Kuhn, who is a senior consultant to the competition practice of Charles River Associates. He's also a professor of economics and deputy director of the Center for Competition Policy at the University of East Anglia School of Economics. Previously, he was chief economist at DG Comp, where he worked extensively on antitrust issues in financial markets and the internet economy. And after that, we have Rosa um, Arantes Metz, who is a managing director in the antitrust securities, data mining, and financial regulation practices of the Global Economics Group. She's also an adjunct professor at NYU's Stern School of Business. She works on matters involving collusion, manipulation, and fraud in a variety of industries, and has published many articles on econometric methods, screens, conspiracies, and manipulations. After that, we have Sonia Pfaffenroth, who is a partner at Arnold & Porter, where her practice focuses on complex antitrust investigations, litigation, and client counseling. She recently co-authored an advisory paper on the antitrust implications of pricing algorithms. Previously, she served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Civil and Criminal Operations of the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division, where she oversaw some of DOJ's most significant antitrust matters. And finally, definitely last but not least, we have Joseph Harrington, who is the Patrick T. Harker Professor of Business Economics and Public Policy at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, and is Department Chair in the Business, Economics, and Public Policy um, Group. His research is widely published and currently focuses on collusion and cartels with the objectives of understanding observed collusive practices, developing observable markers of collusion, and designing competition policy to deter collusion. Each of our panelists will have between five and 10 minutes to make a brief opening statement, and we will then move on to a moderated Q&A. As we did yesterday, we will take uh, questions from the audience. If anybody in the audience has a question, please flag down one of our conference staff for a comments card. They'll collect them and pass them to us. And so with that, we'll start off with Maurice. All right, well, thank you very much for um, this invitation. Um, a few years ago, um, Ariel and I, we were thinking about the migration to online and online pricing, and we thought, what, what would be the implications then that might have on price fixing? Can computers collude? And so what we came up with were four possible scenarios of collusion. 
And the first one, messenger, is the easiest. And there, humans collude and they use then algorithms to help perfect their collusion. And this is really for antitrust a no-brainer. You have evidence of an anti-competitive agreement, the illegality inheres in the agreement, and intent evidence plays a lesser role. And we already have a couple of cases along these lines. First is the Topkins case in the US, and then the UK it was against Trod and uh, GBE. The second scenario is hub and spoke, and here you have a series of competitors that are using the same common algorithm. And one way to think of this would be platforms such as um, Uber, whereby the, um, the users, the consumers, as well as the drivers, the pricing is all determined by a, um, a single algorithm. And then the second would be when multiple competitors are outsourcing their pricing to uh, the same third-party vendor. So here you have a series of vertical agreements, and the issue is when, does, when do those vertical agreements become a hub-and-spoke cartel? And here we could see that you have evidence of an agreement. It's really how you classify the agreement. And you can look at possibly intent evidence to then determine what the likely anti-competitive effects might be. The third scenario, predictable agent, is trickier. Here, you don't have evidence of any agreement. There's no meeting of the minds. But there's strong evidence of anti-competitive intent. Each firm unilaterally decides to use, let's say, a price optimization algorithm. And the industry-wide ad um, adoption of this algorithm helps foster what we call tacit algorithmic collusion. And this presents various policy changes that I'll address at the end. And then the final scenario, which is probably in the, more in the future, is digital eye. Here, there's no evidence of an agreement, nor is there any evidence of anti-competitive intent. Each company utilizes a price optimization algorithm, let's say through machine learning. The algorithms then all then determine that the profitable outcome is tacit collusion. So we don't, the, the owners of these algorithms don't know necessarily if and when their algorithms are colluding, but nonetheless it has the same effect. So what then are some of the policy implications of this? Well, for Messenger, the first one, there really isn't any concern. Our tools are well equipped to address that. Second, for Hub and Scope, we still have the tools to address that. It's going to be trickier than how you characterize that agreement and what sort of guidance can the agency give market participants of when a series of vertical mergers, rate, vertical agreements rather, raise antitrust concerns. But the last two, and I think that's what we're going to largely talk about today, will likely then raise more significant policy issues. So does our current policy towards conscious parallelism apply when price optimization algorithms can enhance firms' ability to tacitly collude. And we're not saying that tacit collusion will occur in every industry, but in industries where tacit collusion might be on the margin, will algorithms help then push it over the edge? And so you might have industries where four to three, five to four um, uh, mergers in industries characterized with um, um, algorithms may be more susceptible to tacit collusion. Second, is our legal concept of agreement outdated for computer algorithms? Are our current laws sufficient to deter and prevent tacit algorithmic collusion? Third, how can the agencies identify when algorithmic collusion occurs, especially when pricing is dynamic? It's very difficult to detect express collusion. Are the tools up to snuff to detect tacit collusion? Next, what additional measures should be considered to reduce the additional risks associated with the use of price optimization algorithms? So our book really wasn't based on Terminator. It was based on discussions with computer scientists who raised these concerns. And moreover, when you look online, what do they promote? They promote avoiding price wars. They promote enabling companies to maximize profits. They talk about how pricing 
is maybe good for the consumer, but bad for the business. And they can help companies avoid these price wars. Now, is this just puffery or is this actuality? And I think we're going to talk about what other agencies are doing. So I think it's very important for the FTC not to discount this as terminator, but rather to take this seriously, like many of the European officials, and start devoting resources to this. That's why I very much am um, encouraged that, that Bruce and others at the FTC held this um, important um, policy hearing uh, today. And then finally, in what ways should firms be obligated to integrate ethics and legality into a computer program? And to what extent are companies going to face liability for their algorithms? To what extent will independent software developers face liability? One of the interesting things in TROD, I don't know I mean, to what extent, but it seems that the companies were going to the software developers and saying, this is not working. We need to tweak this in such a way. If the software developer was aware that these algorithms were being used to help um, 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 a cartel, should they be liable? And to what extent are companies, should they have an affirmative duty to program their computers so as to not tacitly collude? And is that even possible? Those are other policy issues that I would encourage the FTC to explore. Thank you. Next to Dr. Den. Um, thanks, Maurice, and thanks, Bruce, for setting the stage for the discussion. Uh, I also want to thank the FTC for inviting me here. It's an honor to be here today and to speak to you all this morning. Uh, for me, it's always fun to join a conference where my name is on every single slide uh, or in caps. Um, so very happy to be here. Um, as, uh, as Bruce and Maurice just summarized, we really have seen a great deal of interest in and concerns with uh, algorithmic inclusion. Uh, what appears to be particularly troubling is the type of algorithms that are capable of uh, inclusion, tacit or explicit, uh, all by themselves without human interference. Um, there are at least two interesting questions uh, in this discussion. Uh, the first is obviously uh, just how close we are to having uh, colluding robots that are production ready, uh, ready to be deployed by businesses. And secondly, uh, if so, what can we do about them? What can we do about the potential antitrust risks? Um, I'm going to argue that we can go a long way in answering those questions by taking a close look at the literature of economics and artificial intelligence. Now, the existing literature has already uh, a lot of insights to offer. Now, I'm not saying we have all the answers yet, which is why uh, the discussion uh, that the one like the one we're having today is still so relevant and important. Okay, so what do I see as some of the most important lessons we can learn? Uh, first of all, uh, there is clear uh, experimental evidence that an algorithm or a robot could be designed to tacitly cooperate with opponents uh, in environments such, you know, social dilemmas such as uh, prisoner's dilemma, which is a, a kind of a protocol, uh, uh, you know, prototype models that economists study uh, competition. Um, so, at least in experimental settings, I would say colluding robots are no longer a science fiction. Um, secondly, I guess fortunately for us, um, designing a, an algorithm to tacitly collude uh, turns out to be a very challenging technical problem. Now, I'm not going to list all the technical challenges here, um, but I, I just want to give out one uh, example based on a recent uh, AI research uh, that is published uh, just earlier this year. Um, so the researchers pointed out that a good algorithm must be flexible in that it needs to learn to cooperate with others without necessarily having prior knowledge of their behaviors. But to do so, the algorithm must be able to deter potentially exploitative behavior from others. And I quote, when beneficial, determine how to elicit tacit coordination, cooperation from a potentially distrustful uh, opponent who might be disinclined to cooperate. The researchers of the study went on to say that these challenges uh, often cause AI algorithms to deter, uh, defer, defects, I should say, and rather than to cooperate. And I quote, even uh, when doing so would be beneficial to the algorithm's long-term payoffs, end quote. 
Now, there are several reasons why the fact that there are you know, a lot of technical challenges in designing such an algorithm uh, is relevant to us in the antitrust community. Uh, first, I would argue that you know, they show that there's a, uh, perhaps a lack of support uh, for a popular belief that just any le learning algorithm, any kind of a machine learning algorithm that tries to maximize uh, firms' individual profits uh, would necessarily uh, and eventually uh, lead to tacit collusion. This also tells us that to design an algorithm that has some degree of guaranteed success in eliciting tacit coordination from opponents or competitors, this capability to collude uh, most likely needs to be an explicit design feature. Now, this observation itself has further implications. Uh, first, it suggests that, at least from an antitrust uh, policy perspective, uh, we ought to consider the possibility of prohibiting the development and incorporation of certain inclusive or problematic features while balancing the pro and, you know, potentially pro and anti-competitive effects of algorithms. And Joe here actually wrote a recent article uh, in which he explores some of the issues, including this one. Second, um, as a result of the challenges, there may very well be uh, important leads in the records that antitrust agencies and even private parties could look for in an investigation or in a discovery process, and all without technical expertise. Uh, several documents uh, are, are going to be of particular interest. Uh, for example, documents that shed light on the design goals of the algorithm, documents, uh, any documents, uh, of any document behavior of the algorithm, any documents that suggest that the developers may have <laughs> modified or revised the algorithm to further the goal of task coordination. Um, those are going to be very, very helpful. Um, now, another type of documents uh, I think uh, really should raise red flags um, is any marketing or promotion materials that suggest that the developers may have promoted uh, their algorithm's ability to elicit tacit coordination from competitors to their customers. Now, what's interesting here is that I hope you can see that it's not necessary for the investigators to have any sort of intimate understanding of the AI, AI technology uh, to look for, number one, look for such evidence and, and, and even interpret su uh, some of those evidence. Um, another important lesson I think uh, we can learn from the AI research is that, at least if you look at academic literature, the algorithms being designed are not necessarily what economists call equilibrium strategies. Um, equilibrium strategies are intuitively stable in the sense that, you know, I'm going to define this very loosely. We have economists uh, in, uh, you know, on the panel here, so I'm going to define this loosely. Um, equilibrium strategies are uh, stable in the sense that if, you know, you and your competitors uh, know that all of you are adopting certain strategy, uh, you will have no incentive to change, right? This is a known as Nash equilibrium uh, in game theory. Um, as two recent, uh, uh, as two AI researchers put it in a recent article, uh, the question of designing a good agent for social dilemmas, kind of like the competition uh, environment, can be sometimes very different from computing equilibrium strategies. Similarly, in another recent AI study, uh, despite the promising experimental findings, the researchers acknowledge that unless their learning algorithm is an equilibrium strategy, uh, it can be exploited by others meaning that the players who started out using their, uh, using their algorithm may have incentive to deviate, to move away from their algorithm. This means that you know, if a firm happens to uh, adopt a, an algorithm that is non-equilibrium strategy, uh, they may have incentive to move away from that um, and as a result potentially disrupt uh, the uh, potentially inclusive environment. I'm just going to talk very briefly on the economics literature, and I'm sure my uh, co-panelists are going to have a lot to say uh, on this. Um, so there's one literature in economics that study the interplay between information flow and uh, cartel stability. Uh, one early and seminal paper uh, shows that in an environment where firms have very flex flexible production technology, so they can change the production level very, very quickly, and if the information arrives continuously, it turns out that cartel becomes very difficult to sustain. Okay? And further studies uh, even shows that in that environment, one way to sustain a cartel is actually to uh, intentionally delay the information flow. Now, to me, this is a very relevant line of research uh, because presumably, if you think about algorithms, robots, uh, they are potentially uh, uh, 
much more capable in processing uh, and collecting information uh, potentially in real time and really, really quick. Um, in a recent article of mine uh, titled uh, Four Reasons Why We Won't See Colluding Robots Anytime Soon, I made two more points. Uh, I have time to just talk about one. That is, um, despite the fact that algorithms, which are you know, computer codes, right, um, are uh, undoubtedly hard to uh, interpret, especially for many of us in the uh, antitrust community, I do want to know that cartels manifest themselves in other ways that are observable and interpretable. In fact, economists and courts uh, have long been well uh, aware of uh, what's known as plus factors, right? To quote a, a paper, plus factors are uh, economic actions and outcomes uh, above and beyond uh, uh, parallel conduct, uh, but are largely inconsistent with unilateral conduct, uh, but rather uh, in, uh, largely consistent with explicitly coordinated action. So um, I won't give example here in my opening remarks, but we can get into some of the examples. Uh, with that, I'm going to close my remarks and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Well, thank you very much um, as well for the for the invitation. I'm, it's very nice to be here and participate in this discussion. And uh, some of the things that I'm um, have to say really come from some of the research on collusion, especially the, the experimental research that I've been doing in recent years. Um, I think in order to think about policies in this area, it's really important to understand what issues we're exactly addressing. And one of the things that I'm concerned about in this debate is that that sometimes gets mixed up. Um, that is in particular important in terms of the ways that collusion theory is being used because there are two really very separate and different parts of collusion theory that are both important, but where we know a lot more about one than about the other. Uh, or what about the other we now know a lot more, but that's not generally very well known. Um, one aspect, and that is what um, enforcement really targets, is how do we actually come to a common understanding um, of what we should be doing and what's, what are the consequences of if we're not doing it or if we're actually sticking to the agreement. That's what we usually call the coordination problem in that context. And that in theory doesn't play very much of a role because it's very, very hard to model in an applied way uh, how, what coordination activities are, how they work, and how their effectiveness changes in different market environments. So there's basically very little kind of theoretical work on that aspect. The other aspect is uh, what I call the stability of cartels. Um, do I have an incentive to deviate? Because I always have. If I raise the prices, I have an incentive to deviate. Therefore, there needs to be some punishment on the market. If it's tacit collusion, that has to be implicitly learned or intuited. Um, but we have a literature that says, if we can coordinate on an outcome, can we sustain it? And under what circumstances are there more outcomes that we can sustain? But it doesn't tell us really anything about the likelihood that in a particular market situation we're going to see collusion. For that is really on, uh, the question to understand when do we actually see coordination? Um, is something that's coordination activity um, usually talking about it, something that's essential or not? And that leads to the question with coordination, how likely is tacit collusion actually? And what you want to do in the policy area really depends on whether you think the coordination problem is relatively easy to solve and AIs or, or algorithmic um, acting is going to uh, make tacit collusion a lot easier so that coordination is less of a problem, or whether you think, well, maybe the rapid interaction is good for stability, but it doesn't really affect coordination all that much. Because in the first case, you want to just use the existing and maybe expand and adapt instruments on uh, enforcing against coordination activity. In the other case, you have a real problem. Um, and those are the kind of the, the things that Joe, I think, has been thinking about. Now, I believe, and this is something that's very important, is that out of the research in the last 15 years, we've actually learned that coordination is actually much harder than we always thought, especially in situations that are relatively complicated. Uh, there's an experimental uh, literature on coordination games 
uh, that has shown uh, already in the early 1990s, even if you have ranked equilibria, you might actually go to the worst one if people are doing it experimentally. And the reason is, if you're trying to achieve something that's very good for everybody, if someone isn't coordinated, that's really bad. And just the fact that you want to ensure against that, then under those circumstances kind of leads to very bad outcomes. And I've, I've argued many years ago in a policy article on collusion that the reason why you want to enforce against coordination activity is precisely the fact that if we don't see that, uh, we're gonna have a reversion to very competitive behavior because collusion models have that structure that it's actually very risky to collude at high prices because if someone else doesn't understand it and get it, and we don't have a com fully common understanding, then that's very risky and you want to insure against it, and that brings the prices down. That's what we kind of see in those things. We do see in a lot of situations that there's collusion, but very much from what you've heard about algorithms, people have run these things in the past on simple two by two games, two strategies, two players. And there you got a lot of experimentation between people because people do experiment and you see a lot of what happens with contingency. Now the interesting thing is if you're going into the experimental literature and have three players, um, usually you don't get the coordination and, uh, without communication and it just all collapses. We've even seen this a lot in two player situations as soon as the games get a bit more complex, you have price setting with capacity constraints, um, you have a larger set of strategies. Kind of in the first case, we tried to write an experimental paper on coordinated effects of mergers, and I couldn't get the guys to tacitly collude. It just wouldn't work. As soon as they communicated, the theory worked out perfectly. And we see in all of that literature, at least from a minimum of three players onwards, if you can't communicate, um, collusion just basically is, is very rare. Um, and the same thing happens um, if, even if you just announce prices, right? That's not enough because what the uh, coordination really involves is, is learning how one should be thinking about contingent strategies, which are very complicated coordination to do, okay? So the question here is, if individuals can't do this very well, would algorithms do this a lot better? And one of the arguments are that they're, you know, they're profit maximizing, uncompromising, profit maximizing, they're really good, we're just a bit more boundedly rational, and so they're gonna get there much better. Now the reason why that is not right is that the coordination problem as such um, is something that you can't solve by rationality. Uh, you cannot reason through by you knowing that you're rational, that everybody knows that everybody is else is rational. Can't reason through how you should be playing something that in principle has two equilibrium. So what we're consistently seeing in those types of situations is that the thing that brings you out is actually talking about it and basically making sure that you come to a common understanding. Uh, that's been the subject of a paper, of an experimental paper we've written where we've analyzed the communication and the really effective thing was to communicate about contingent strategies and say, if you don't, then I'm going to punish. And the other guy says, why would you do that? And they have a long conversation until they understand why that makes sense and then they implement it. When they don't do this, they, have a, they, they basically don't get to collusion in the long run. Now, if you're taking that to the algorithms, you're kind of asking your question, do we have anything else that might, might tell us that if it's just an algorithm, we might have the similar problems? There's an interesting literature out there uh, from the early 1990s where, where people were doing dynamic evolutionary games, not evolutionary stability, that has the same thing where you say, what's an equilibrium, does someone deviate? All the questions we're asking with algorithms is, how do you get to the agreement? How do you get to equilibrium, right? And there, again, there's a very strong result out there that says if you um, have this type of evolutionary games as they were specified then, which I think you could think about as a genetic algorithm as well, um, you will get something that's called a risk-dominant equilibrium. That is this problem of going very high to a high price, but then having bad payoff as someone is not coordinated is actually a very large one, and you're going to be selecting these equilibrium the push in the collusion games would be going towards lower prices. So I think the question then is, um, 
you know, is there anything that we would know from the AI literature, from the, from the artificial intelligence algorithm literature that would tell us that algorithms would have less coordination problems? There are specific situations in which algorithms are very good at that. And I haven't quite seen that, and I, I, was, I, I was thinking I would be telling me that there's all this literature out where, where this might actually uh, be done, and I've seen some literature on algorithms that do get to collusion, but again, they're in the context of very, very simple games, and the complexity of this with, as soon as you're getting to something with realistic markets, gets much, much higher, and dimensionality is there kind of a curse in, in, in all situations. Um, so I think once you start thinking about it in this way, there's, there's kind of the question, well, there, there are a lot of things that you can do with the current instruments. Um, there, there's literature that would suggest that, yes, if you're exchanging your algorithms, both sides know what it is, you might get to collusion, uh, even if you're not explicitly talking about it. Well, that's like information exchange, where you're telling others what your proposed price is. Actually, it's even more than that. You're telling them what your contingent price is for all eventualities in the future. Right? I would think that would come under the typical prohibitions of information exchange on prices um, that we already have. I think that the way to think about some of these things is, you know, can we think about how coordination mechanisms work? Can we give obligations on transparency of that, uh, on those types of things where that, that is, is necessary? Um, and do we have to come, kind of come to some kind of transparency, for example, on issues where we would have AIs like communicating and what that would be would be meaning for the for, for regulation but I think that's more the issue and that's why I'm much more concerned about than rampant tacit collusion thank you the next up we have dr. Brenta Smiths um, good morning let me start by uh, thanking the invitation to be here it's it's a pleasure to be here um, I would like to take a step back and, and think about um, algorithms in starting in a little bit of a different way. If as economists we think about the situation where we have many competitors, we have homogeneous products and cost and production functions, uh, we have perfect competition and no entry, perfect competition means full transparency about everything, um, then we have perfect competition. Price is equal to marginal cost, that's the socially desirable outcome, and that's what economists uh, take as the benchmark and compare real market outcomes against. So then the question becomes actually whether pricing algorithms, uh, given um, that they are associated with higher transparency and uh, through them uh, there's a higher chance and normally it happens that you can more quickly respond to changing market conditions and competitors including, aren't they actually fomenting uh, more the likelihood that we will see more um, uh, perfect competition-like outcomes than uh, instead collusion. Um, so I think we need to start by thinking about taking this as the benchmark and then start thinking about as we deviate from it, is it really more likely that we're going to see uh, tacit collusion coming out of these algorithms um, or, or not? Um, I think that there is, um, even the, given the limited empirical ev evidence to date, a high chance that we're talking, that we're going to see higher, more fierce competition coming out of these algorithms um, than uh, necessarily um, a lot of evidence of additional tacit collusion. That, that doesn't mean that that has not already occurred and that won't occur. The question is whether the likelihood is higher or if those are more isolated events. So I think what we have to understand really also is that both situations will lead to similar prices among competitors. Perfect competition will lead to completely identical prices but low prices and the tacit collusion will lead to equal prices at a higher level. Um, and so we need to be able to distinguish the two situations if we're saying that algorithms tacitly collude and they are leading to equal prices, well, are those prices necessarily too high? Is that a necessarily highly undesirable social outcome? Um, so we know from theoretically that it is possible uh, that uh, particular market structures will 
uh, enable be uh, enabling factors of collusion uh, when pricing algorithms are, are used. Uh, but I think what is really important to understand is whether uh, the empirical evidence backs that up and also how do pricing algorithms actually change what's called the plus factors uh, in a way that make it hard to provide a general rule as to whether uh, tacit collusion uh, is more likely to occur or not. Of course, we, we always start with um, thinking of the situation where we have as just a small number of players. We have high barriers of entry, some uh, high product hom homogeneity. And then because pricing algorithms um, are usually uh, going to work in high transparency world and they enable more interaction, they can even replace the direct communication among competitors, then it is possible that they will facilitate tacit collusion in theory um, because they facilitate signaling potentially, they facilitate the monitoring of prices, um, and they facilitate the punishment uh, of deviations from a potential collusive agreement. Um, but the, the, as it has been mentioned earlier, what we are also worried is that these kinds of concerns that are typically in the oligopolistic situation will extend to situations where markets are less concentrated. But let's start by thinking also how do price algorithms and the availability of so much data and market transparency actually affect some of the components, some of the market structure and demand and supply factors that would normally tell us that if X exists, then collusion is more likely or not. Um, let's think, for example, just to give a couple examples in terms of demand. Um, uh, everything else the same, um, it, typically the availability of these pricing algorithms in retail uh, internet uh, trading um, is going to reduce the is going to increase, I'm sorry, the elasticity of demand by consumers simply because it's much more easy, it's easier, the search cost is low, it's easier to search across different web pages, my elasticity of demand is higher and therefore market power is lower. Uh, we can think the same way about uh, barriers to entry. We know that large data uh, in highly concentrated markets may provide a, an additional barrier to entry. On the other hand, the digital economy is full of examples where those situations were ever overcome by entrants and in which that level of high transparency actually enabled uh, a reduction of entry costs to the potential entrant. Also, markets where there's a lot of innovation tend to be markets that are typically markets in which a lot of these pricing algorithms are applied. Um, tend to be markets that are more difficult to collude upon. Um, so there's a lot of structural components that do get changed in these situations that make it hard to have a, a general rule and assessment in terms of the typical plus factors that we tend to use in collusion matters uh, as to whether uh, we should expect, even theoretically, for tacit collusion to be more likely um, in these situations. I would like, now like to talk just a little bit about whatever empirical evidence may exist out there that may uh, give us some more information as to whether um, uh, tacit collusion may be more likely. For example, uh, the S&P 500 releases every year um, industry-specific returns on equity and, and net profit margins. And every year, systematically, the retail sector has the lowest profit margins of all industries between 0.5 and 3.5%, and that's particularly true for web-only based retailers. So are the prices probably converging to the same level? Probably, are they monitoring each other? Yes, but they don't seem to be making that much money compared to others. So again, um, how likely is it that these pricing algorithms are really going to lead us under certain circumstances to more competitive rather than less competitive outcomes? As another example that is particularly more familiar to me because those are the type of cases that I tend to focus on the last couple of decades, are cases involving, for example, commodities trading cases um, and financial markets in general. Um, over the last two decades, particularly the last decade, there has been a, a large effort to move trading from over-the-counter to exchanges. Now, what is just 
in a couple of words the, the main difference between the two. Over-the-counter trading, uh, you typically, the information is not available to every market player. You don't really know what are all of the offers to buy and sell at any moment in time. You have no visibility, no transparency to where the market is, aside from some average value that somebody provides to you. Highly opaque markets. When these products get moved into exchanges where at any moment in time you know where all of the market is, you know what everybody is willing to buy and sell, um, and you don't know who you are buying and sell with until you actually trade and execute the trade, but you have transparency which has enabled um, uh, a lot of pricing algorithms to, to emerge and be um, uh, more widely applied. Uh, what, what have we observed in terms of market efficiency with this move? We have observed that the bid-ask spreads, which are actually the dealer profit margin, the difference between at which they buy and they sell, have shrink, shrank drastically. So we have observed lower prices, even in situations where the exchanges that are uh, more expensive to operate than over-the-counter trading. There's a lot of fees that go into operating an exchange. We actually see that prices are going down. Now, do we see collusion situations um, happening? Absolutely, but actually we see a whole lot less collusion happening uh, in these exchanges where pricing algorithms are so enabled due to higher transparency. Uh, prices are more correlated because everybody's training their algorithm in the same data set, but the episodes of collusion in exchanges that are exchange specific are actually a whole lot lower. We know we have seen so much uh, collusion and manipulation lately, but those situations, 90% of them, were related to deficient structures such as benchmarks rigging, uh, auction rigging, that were themselves deficient, which led and facilitated uh, rigging. Uh, with respect to actual Trading that occurs naturally in an exchange and in over-the-counter, uh, there is no um, comparison between the incidence of collusion in these very highly transparent market based on exchanges and the over-the-counter. So I think that even though the empirical evidence is limited, I think we need to th sort out through what is already available out there and think about whether um, if we are to regulate a problem that we may potentially be misdiagnosing, if we're actually going to undercut all the potential benefits that we may have from these techniques. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank the FTC for the uh, invitation to be here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'd just like to start by saying that the views I expressed today are <coughs> my own, not those of Arnold Porter or any of our clients. Um, so I'd like to shift gears slightly and talk a little bit about enforcement currently. Um, you know, in the current time where algorithmic enabled collusion still requires human input at some point in the process. Um, and Bruce mentioned the OECD paper that the agencies uh, drafted last year. Um, and that paper drew the distinction between <coughs> interdependent behavior and collusive behavior. And collusion requires an agreement between two parties. Um, the enforcers have, have said that algorithms are a tool, and you have people determining the goals and designing the algorithm to meet the goals of that tool. And as a tool, the algorithm can be a mechanism to implement a collusive <coughs> agreement. It could be a, a technology that assists in policing an agreement that's already in place um, to deter cheating. Um, but as a tool, the algorithm in that context is sort of the technological equivalent of the stereotypical meeting in the smoke-filled room where the agreement is, is, is reached and, and facilitated. So in that context, you have a, a person, a human being, putting the algorithm in motion and directing it to perform a, a set of actions in the context of a collusive agreement that is in violation of the antitrust laws. And even if 
once that's set in motion, it becomes self-executing, there's still predicate communication. There's still a predicate agreement between parties that led to that action. Um, Maurice referenced the Topkins Trod case. So this was a, a, a case prosecuted by the DOJ um, in which uh, Topkins and his co-conspirators were accused of fixing the prices of, of, of art, of posters that were sold online through the Amazon marketplace. And in that case, um, the DOJ was alleging that the co-conspirators had used uh, commercially available um, algorithmic-based pricing software um, that operated by uh, collecting competitor pricing information and then um, applying certain pricing rules to that, that data um, to set pricing. And in that case, the way DOJ described the, the conduct was that um, specific pricing software was adopted um, with the goal of coordinating pricing changes. So uh, one conspirator uh, would program its algorithm to look at the price of a non-conspiring competitor and set the price slightly below that. And then other conspirators would set the, their pricing software to look at the price of the first conspirator. And, and therefore, through the use of that software, it was executing on an agreement to um, coordinate pricing changes, to control <coughs> price. And, and the way it was described after that initial agreement, it was largely self-executing, but there was an agreement at the beginning. And so that enforcement action is an example of competitors agreeing directly within the traditional framework to use that algorithmic software to execute an anti-competitive agreement. It's an electronic tool. Um, it's not the first time that electronic tools have been uh, pointed to by enforcement agencies as a tool to enable collusion. Back in the 90s, the DOJ settled charges uh, that airlines that had a jointly owned computerized online booking system were using that as a tool to fix prices. Um, there was also a, a reference to Uber. Um, and so on the side of the private litigation, um, there was a case pending in uh, the Southern District of New York, um, and not commenting on any merits of the case, but just with respect to the framework in which the court looked at that. And the, the case ultimately uh, went to arbitration instead, but there was a consideration of the merits of the arguments and a motion to dismiss before that happened. And in that case, you had the court looking at it as, as, as Maurice referenced, uh, a hub and spoke <coughs> framework where the, the, there was allegations that drivers that join Uber uh, are agreeing with each other to use the same algorithm to set prices. So that, that, that there was a rim and a hub, again, within the traditional framework of considering collusive agreements. Um, if there isn't an agreement between competitors, then algorithms have the capacity to allow competitors to observe more quickly, match prices more quickly. Um, it may be more effective than other types of observation capabilities that companies have had available to them in the past. But without the underlying agreement, it's still parallel conduct. It's still parallel pricing, which is not um, illegal under antitrust frameworks. And something enforcers have, have made clear is that independent action, independent action is still parallel. So for example, if uh, two competitors independently, without communication, go out and adopt the same pricing software, and that increases the likelihood of interdependent pricing and may even act to stabilize pricing, there's still no agreement. There's still no uh, collusive conduct that forms the basis of an antitrust uh, uh, violation. Um, and so th you have had, um, historically, the agencies articulating this as focusing on the behavior, focusing on the anti-competitive behavior between parties, not the outcomes <laughs> of the consequences of certain actions that are taken independently. Um, and so 
you know, thinking about it from a business perspective, from the practical counseling perspective, if that bright line weren't there, that agreements between competitors to collude with respect to price setting is unlawful, independent action that may result in price stabilization but does not involve any communication between competitors is not unlawful. If that bright line is taken away, um, it would make it very complex and difficult for a business to determine where the line is. Where is market transparency no longer pro-competitive? And when does it become anti-competitive? You know, when is the threshold for when conscious parallelism, which is lawful, um, when does that become lawful? That would be very difficult to define <coughs> and very difficult to, to counsel with respect to. Um, all of that said, I think that even in the current environment, and this is something that, that others have alluded to and, and, and Maurice talked about at the beginning, um, there is still the opportunity for risk for companies, even if they are not engaged in um, collusive agreements, that certain behavior or business strategies or the adoption of the same pricing software or the use of a common uh, platform could give rise to inferences that there is in fact an underlying agreement. And that's something from a business risk perspective that businesses have to focus on to make sure that conduct which is in fact lawful <coughs> under the antitrust laws doesn't give rise to an inference, potential investigation or litigation risk, um, that it is in fact uh, the product of an underlying agreement. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much, and I think that leaves us with Joe. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you to the FTC for putting together this panel. Uh, suppose managers at competing companies independently decided to let AI determine the prices they charge. Due to the complexity of AI, these managers are, are unable to foresee what will result. Further suppose that these AI programs have learned to collude as reflected in prices above competitive levels. Algorithmic collusion has emerged and it is harming consumers. Now the legal challenge in prosecuting those companies is that the law is rooted in conspiracy, but there is no conspiracy here. To be more specific, what is unlawful is an agreement between competitors, where an agreement is, according to the US Supreme Court, a meeting of minds in an unlawful arrangement, or a conscious commitment to a common scheme. This legal perspective is also present in European Union jurisprudence, where an agreement means that companies have joint intention and a concurrence of wills. In other words, companies have an unlawful agreement when they have mutual understanding to restrict competition. Now, the courts have laid out various paths towards proving that there is an unlawful agreement. Common to them is an overt act of communication between companies intended to coordinate their conduct. There must be evidence of communication. However, neither mutual understanding to limit competition nor communication to facilitate that mutual understanding is present with algorithmic collusion. The AI programs are simply setting prices, recording prices and sales and other relevant data, and adapting the pricing rule in a manner to yield higher profits. There is no overt act of communication between the managers, nor between the AI programs. There is no mutual understanding to restrain competition between the managers as they acted independently and did not foresee the collusion that would emerge. And there is no mutual understanding among the AI programs unless one is prepared to attribute understanding to AI. According to the law, algorithmic collusion is legal because there is no agreement, still prices are above competitive levels. Now in developing a legal approach to prosecuting algorithmic collusion, it will, it will be uh, proved useful to first ask, why is it that the courts have made communication to limit uh, competition unlawful rather than limiting competition? It is the practice that facilitates exclusive pricing which is unlawful rather than inclusive pricing itself. To elaborate on this point, suppose company A verbally expresses to company B that company A will raise price and goes on to say that it will keep price at that high level only if company B matches it. Otherwise, company A will return price to its original low level. After company A conveys this message to company B, suppose company A raises price and company B matches it. 
based on their communications and their pricing conduct, companies A and B would be convicted of violating Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Now suppose companies A and B use those same pricing rules, whereby company A raises price and keeps it there if company B matches the price and otherwise drops price back down, while company B's pricing rule has it match company A's price increase. If the companies use those pricing rules but did not communicate the result is collusive prices, but they will not have violated the law. There is collusion, by which I mean the use of pricing rules to support uh, super competitive prices, but no communication. Now the reason that collusion without communication is, is uh, lawful is because of an evidentiary hurdle. Collusion is about the use of a reward punishment scheme. If you price high, then I will reward you by pricing high. And if you price low, then I will punish you by pricing low. One can think of it as a contractual arrangement among competitors for sustaining prices above competitive levels. The evidentiary challenge is that we observe prices but not the reward punishment scheme that may be sustaining them. The reward punishment scheme resides in the heads of the colluding managers. If we see one company raise price and the other match it, we cannot be sure that it's an exclusive deal or that these prices, price increases are driven by, say, a common rise in cost. We cannot get inside the heads of the managers to know what is underlying their conduct. Did a manager raise price with the intent that its competitors match that price increase and put in an end to price competition? Or is there a legitimate competitive rationale for companies to have raised their prices? Now returning to discussing algorithmic collusion, here's the critical observation. While we cannot get inside a manager's head, we can get inside the head of an AI program. At any moment, the program's code includes a pricing rule, which it uses to set price. We can engage in testing to learn the properties of that pricing rule, and in particular, whether those properties are collusive. Is the pricing rule designed to punish competitors with low prices, should they seek to undercut price? Is the pricing rule designed to raise price, but maintain it there only if rival companies match that price increase? More generally, is the pricing rule collusive in the sense of using a reward punishment scheme to sustain higher prices and eliminate price competition. The realization that we can, in principle, determine the pricing rule that an AI program is using is the basis for a different legal approach designed to deal with algorithmic collusion. This approach makes, in, makes limiting competition illegal rather than communicating to limit competition. My proposal is to have a per se prohibition on pricing algorithm, algorithms that limit price competition. Liability would be determined by dynamic testing which means entering data into the pricing algorithm and monitoring the output in terms of prices to determine whether the algorithm is unlawful. Having established the set of prohibited pricing algorithms, the burden would be on companies to monitor their AI programs to ensure that their, their pricing algorithms comply with the law. Implementation of this legal approach will require extensive research by economists and computer scientists to identify a set of prohibited pricing algorithms. This set should include pricing algorithms that promote collusion while at the same time not including pricing algorithms that promote efficiency. For example, algorithms that adjust prices in response to demand information. I believe this is feasible because the properties that enhance efficiency seem quite distinct from those that promote collusion. Towards identifying a class of prohibited pricing algorithms, I would propose the following three-step research program. In the first step, create a simulated market setting with AI programs that produce both competitive inclusive prices as outcomes. And in fact, that is currently ongoing. In step two, investigate the resulting pricing algorithms in order to identify those properties that are present when inclusive prices emerge, but are not present when competitive prices emerge. Those properties serve to define a candidate set of prohibited pricing algorithms. Step three, test a candidate set of prohibited pricing algorithms by assessing the impact on market outcomes from restricting those pricing algorithms to not lie in the prohibited set. Now let me conclude with a, with a kind of cautionary comment. Should at some future time algorithmic collusion occur and should it become ubiquitous, existing jurisprudence would offer no legal recourse to stopping it. Consumers are currently unprotected from algorithmic collusion. To my knowledge, a per se prohibition on inclusive pricing algorithms is the only available approach to preventing algorithmic, algorithmic collusion. While implementation of this legal approach faces some significant technical challenges, they are not insurmountable. But more daunting than those technical challenges is the alternative, which is leaving a massive loophole in the law that would allow companies to limit competition through algorithmic collusion. Thank you.
All right, I want to thank all of our panelists for interesting opening remarks there. We'd like to spend the rest of our time um, with a moderated question and answer. And to kick things off, we've heard a lot of references both in the opening remarks of the panelists and in, and in Bruce's introduction about um, the debate that's going on. There have been some interesting comments here about the ways that we can potentially identify and deal with any collusion that's going on today. Curious to get the panel's reaction on um, just the sufficiency of the tools that are available to enforcement agencies today. And really, you can focus on tools to detect, tools to deal with whatever we find, um, policy proposals for us to think about. And thought maybe we could start with Maurice. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, we have a, uh, a, a new paper that we just put up on SSRN, Sustainable and Unchallenged Algorithmic Tasks of Collusion, in which we address some of the, um, the concerns. And what we first find is that express collusion is often more durable than what we um, identify. Second, what we find is that in the, for, in the legal world, there is the assumption that tacit collusion can occur without communications. But third, and I think which is particularly interesting here, is recent experimental evidence that justifies some of the concerns that Joe has raised, whereby you have algorithms that then collude when playing with a human. And in fact, they reach a collusive outcome earlier than when humans, human and human um, experiment. And then also they see tacit collusion among algorithms. They first tried it with two Q learning algorithms and then they went to three Q learning algorithms. They then had 30 price levels. They went up to 100 price levels and what they found was that tacit collusion occurred and was very stable. And then finally, we have some real world evidence, although indirectly, with RPM. There was the recent case that the European Commission brought against the um, uh, Pioneer and other electronic developers. And what was interesting here is because the industry relied on these uh, pricing algorithms, Pioneer only had to go and target, let's say, th the one discounter. And then once it did so, once that discounter then increased its price, all the others then followed rather quickly thereafter. And you see this in some of the uh, literature for the software ventures, is how the software w vendors, how do you identify leaders? How do you identify followers? And if you could identify the leaders, then you can avoid these price wars. So what should the agencies do? Well, let's look at what some of the things that are happening now. First is research projects, and I think that would be key. I mean, the Germans and the French are um, announced in 2018 that they're going to in engage in extensive research project the European Commission as well. Second is to have a dedica dedicated team within the agency. Uh, the ACCC has a data analytics commission. Third would be looking at some of the policy proposals already on the table. So the Germany's uh, Monopolies Commission um, had some recent proposals on algorithmic collusion, including systematically investigating these markets to see what risk will likely emerge. Because as Joe points out, this can be quite pernicious, and detecting actual collusion is already difficult enough. Deter detecting tacit collusion can be really difficult. And then finally, what I think here, one of the things that we recommended in our OECD paper was creating these tacit collusion incubators. And we're already starting to see scholars doing that. That's the two studies that we cite in our paper were based on that. But I think this would be an excellent opportunity for the agencies particularly to better understand under what circumstances will this tacit collusion occur and then to prevent it through merger policy. That's, I mean, I remember when I was at the DOJ, we were, you know, we were told, well, with collusion, stuff happens. We don't really know when it, when it happens, when it doesn't happen. We had very good tools for unilateral effects, but not so much for collusion, and I think these tacit collusion incubators, or these algorithmic collusion incubators, can really give us insights into what conditions may emerge or substantially lessen competition along this dimension. So I, I, would, just, I would just echo what uh, Maurice just said. I think he gave a lot of good advice. 
And to me, I mean, although I said that um, I do believe that there's a lot uh, we could do, even without expert, uh, you know, technical expertise on AI to in terms of uncover and interpret uh, evidence, uh, I do think that having technical expertise uh, within the agency or at least have easy access to that type of expertise, I think it's going to be very helpful. As Joe pointed out, I mean, if you look at the uh, algorithms, uh, you know, it's basically a piece, you know, piece of computer program, and you can read, you can, you know, try them out in different uh, environments. Um, and I do want to caution that, you know, uh, right now, if you look at the literature, a lot of uh, studies, of course, they are uh, largely experimental studies, meaning the researchers uh, really need to specify the market environment, you know, the demand, the supply, the pricing options, uh, the strat strategies available to the AI agents. Uh, you know, as, as any simulation studies, uh, the limitation is that um, there is always a concern that when you get out of that environment, that controlled environment, uh, do you still see the same kind of phenomenon? Um, I think that's always a, uh, uh, something to keep in mind when we interpret the experimental studies. Um, and um, I do think that there's a lot we can learn from just keeping a close eye on the uh, technical side, the AI literature, as I said. Uh, I think we as an antitrust community uh, can benefit a lot by simply keeping a close eye on those because um, there is a lot of interest in the AI field uh, to develop uh, those algorithms. Now, of course, their goal is not to develop colluding robots, right, just to be clear. Um, their goal is to develop algorithms that could uh, you know, work with humans and make our life easier. Um, even in social dilemmas, we, even when uh, the algorithm subjectives uh, kind of you know, uh, conflict with uh, human objectives and how they can learn to work with each other in particular with humans. So I just want to be clear, it's not that you know, the AI fields are you know, evil colluders you know, trying to design things uh, hurt us. Um, but the research that they have done, you know, uh, we can learn a lot in terms of uh, the limitations, the challenges um, of designing uh, uh, collusive algorithms. Thank you. That's, don't mean to interrupt, but just one quick question. Uh, you had mentioned earlier a lot of evidence that as someone that manages merger investigations, I see a lot of you know documents and, and that sort of thing. Do you still see a role for technologists in, in helping to interpret that sort of thing? Because again, as you were describing it, the material sounded familiar, but I was just thinking, as this field is changing so fast, do you still see a role for technologists in that process? Yeah, that's a good question. I do think that, uh, at least in the initial uh, stage, I don't see that you need uh, a lot of technical expertise. Um, I mean, I can give you a couple papers in the AI field, and uh, you know, if you just read the uh, abstract and the conclusion section, you know exactly what they're trying to do. You know exactly how their algorithms performed. Uh, in kind of control environment, you know, that simulates, you know, competition, how they were able to collude or not able to collude. So I do think that at, at, in the first pass, uh, you know, it, it, people with experience and the trust, you know, understanding the markets um, already can go a long way. And I think, you know, eventually if you go into the uh, program, that's where absolutely I, I think you do need uh, experts to interpret. Thanks. Sorry, Kai Uwe. No, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, I. I think, I mean, I, I'm, I do think we have a lot more uh, possibilities with traditional tools even in this field um, than, we're, than we're kind of admitting in this, in this context. And um, I think this is a little bit underestimating also the um, coordination activities that are just necessarily necessary in order to get there. And I've, I found that very revealing with one of the comments that Joe made when he was talking about the, the algorithm can be designed in a way to collude. And that's essentially what otherwise the, the coordination activity would be. I mean, th th there's a great difficulty, and I talked about this, which is, in principle, if you don't know what the other guy's algorithm is, you're playing against lots of algorithms, and that, that becomes a really complex problem in how you're getting the algor other algorithm to converge to common behavior. Um, and how to do, induce that, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether any, anybody knows. But even if you're trying to do something like this, I think the, the activity of trying to put a mechanism into the algorithm um, it, that would lead to collusion is much more detectable than actually looking at the algorithm and asking the question is if it reacts by saying, cut the price if the other guy cuts the price, is that part of a collusive strategy? because we see lots of markets in which there's sequential price setting, 
the virtually all markets where there's sequential price setting. And uh, those tend to be very competitive markets in which the prices sequentially are, are lowered. So I, I'm not convinced that we are going to be very good at identifying collusive strategies from very complicated algorithms, or, or maybe not so complicated algorithms, but basically saying this is a collusive strategy, because we only know that if we know what they had in mind, what the strategies were of the algorithms that they were trying to play against and that they were trying to coordinate with. So on the other hand, if there is an attempt to do this actively, then there are people around who know that we were trying to design an algorithm like this. And you would be generating the same information as you're getting now from kind of someone spilling the beans internally. Um, and so in that sense, well, maybe that wouldn't be the typical communication or coordination behavior, and one might want to increase that scope a little. But that's what I said before. You, you actually want to look at the coordination behavior, the sharing of a price, the clear intention of having a rule in the algorithm that is trying to lead to collusion that you would want to target. Uh, because you're much more likely that you're going to get evidence about that. While price setting and price movements um, and even strategies are really, really hard to interpret. Uh, because, you know, how you're going to test the algorithm? What did they have in mind? Who the, what the algorithms were on the other side? That's kind of the unknown in this. And that's why I'm, I'm much more circumspect about uh, what Joe is suggesting, uh, but certainly I think if one is thinking much more about what are the activities to kind of get there, you're getting much more step-by-step -step increments in the direction of dealing with the issue that you can actually understand and, and that fit into the, the current framework. I, I would like to just make a small comment on, I think that um, it would benefit the business community if um, there were general principles, general rules, not necessarily forbidding uh, per se, doesn't mean that it can't be as Joe suggested, but having general rules, guidelines on uh, uh, what should we desire in a pricing algorithm and what we should not and the conditions under which we should be more concerned about certain features than others. We have that for communications among competitors. And um, I think that um, if we are to build structures that are better from the start, um, we are then less likely to find ourselves in bigger problems later on. Um, you know, I, I always think about what happened with the financial benchmark situation where for years I had said that these structures were easy to rig and pretty much everywhere we digged, we found rigging extensively and massively, but somehow, um, the authorities were distracted, I believe, because only after LIBOR broke, um, we started to come up with guidelines on what are the good principles for financial benchmarks. So I think we should have a more proactive role in this case and start by conducting more research and having more of these types of discussions and come up with good principles uh, on which to base on these pricing algorithms that the community, business community knows, and to Sonia's point, they don't suddenly get shocked that something that they did had no clue they were now liable uh, in some, at some level, and then start from then on and see whether, um, whether the guidelines that we come up with do need some sort of an extension or um, a, a little bit of a broader view of what an agreement actually is. Um, and I just wanted to, to build quickly on something that Kai Uwe mentioned a minute ago. Um, so I think something else that's important to consider in the context of the increasing use of, of algorithmic pricing um, for businesses is not just a situation where um, you know you have to competitors agreeing that they're going to adopt the certain pricing software. But also thinking about where uh, information sharing, the sharing of information itself regarding um, what specific algorithm has been adopted, what software has been adopted, or um, certain aspects about technologically how it functions, that that type of information sharing between competitors, even if there is no 
explicit agreement that they're going to set the parameters to uh, a, a certain set of actions or to take a certain set of outcomes still gives rise to antitrust risk because sharing the algorithm, the existence of the algorithm, the, uh, the choice of a certain algorithm or the, the mechanisms by which it function could conceivably be closely akin to sharing pricing information, which, which itself can be uh, a risky or violative behavior even in the absence of the explicit agreement. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me kind of respond to a, a, a couple of remarks made and then kind of address the question. So to be very clear, uh, my remarks say, I had nothing to say about the likelihood that I would assign to algorithmic collusion, was saying that if it, if it were to occur, what would be the legal response? Right now, the legal response would be we couldn't do anything. We need to develop something else. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm also kind of sympathetic with the challenges that Cayuba mentioned with regards to the approach that I'm you know, proposing. Uh, it's not going to be easy, uh, but I do think collusion is a discrete phenomenon. That's not just something that's a little bit less competitive. Uh, we know in practice, we know in simulations, uh, but it must say practice and actual co uh, conduct by humans, that there is a discrete change in conduct. And, it, and it's all rooted in this idea of reward punishment, quite different from competition. And so it, it's starting from that principle that I think that you know, it, is, uh, it offers enough potential to be able to try to identify properties of inclusive pricing rules that this, I think, is a viable approach. How exactly that will work out, you know, we really won't know until the research is conducted. There's going to have to be lots of problems solved. You know, in terms of the original question, I'm going to respond in a much broader way in terms of, you know, what we can learn from other jurisdictions, uh, which is I, I, one of the things that is going to become more common in the midst of collusion by algorithms, whether it's algorithmic collusion or it's just pricing algorithms being used to kind of supplement kind of existing uh, modes of uh, collusion, uh, is detection. Because what we're imagining here is that these pricing algorithms However, they're being used is conditioning on easily available prices of rivals. So we're not thinking about intermediate goods markets here. We're thinking about retail markets on the whole. So, uh, so we're looking at a setting in which a competition authority or any third party could, in principle, engage in screening. That is, looking at that same data to try to find patterns of that are consistent with collusion. So the idea of, of screening for cartels as looking at market data to try to identify them is something that's being done in a number of, of jurisdictions, but, but is not being done in the U.S. I was recently at a uh, meeting with about uh, 25 to 30 chief economists from various uh, jurisdictions. About two-thirds of them said that their, their uh, agency was engaging in some form of screening. Some just kind of experimenting with it, some putting lots of resources in, into it, such as in the case of Brazil. Uh, the US DOJ was there. Uh, they were part of that minority that was not engaging in screening. So I would say you know, what we can learn and what we can do is to, to try to make screening a kind of a more of, a, of a, a standard practice for competition authorities, because I think that's going to become more and more useful if, in fact, pricing algorithms become a more important component of collusion. Let me just add one point on that. Um, competition authorities are also, some of them, starting to interested to be interested in developing these types of um, AI techniques to detect. So beyond the typical screening, many of them have very large data sets of actual bid rigging. Um, they have collected for, for a very long time. And I, for example, am working on one of those projects where we are starting to develop um, uh, a model to detect potential bid rigging applied to a different data set, but training it on a particular data set. So some of the agencies are actually going much beyond the typical mm -hmm. screening that we have been doing for some of them for some years to getting more up to speed into um, AI techniques. So I, I do agree with Joe, this is something that should definitely be done. Any other comments? I have a, yes, yeah, just of a, course. Just a rejoinder on, on two of the remarks that were, were done here on information exchange. So I think in developing rules, it's always important if you want to have a per se rule, which is really good for incentives and, and for firms to have clarity, 
um, you want to make sure that the costs are relatively low. And I think some of the suggestions that come here in, in order to, to say certain, basically any information exchange about what your algorithm is, uh, you can make illegal because it's very hard to think of, think of any good reason why you should be sharing your algorithm with your competitor or, or information about your algorithm to the competitor. So, so this is, this is uh, kind of one of the examples where I would say we basically have the legal framework uh, on information exchange. It falls very much into the same similar category of exchanging prices that you want to set in the future. Uh, why not do that if you need an extension there to, to make it clear that that falls under it legally? Well, well, do it. But that's a very traditional approach that I think would already go very, very far, even in addressing Joe's concerns, because it, it then makes it unclear what I'm actually competing against, and that, that makes it much, much harder to get there. Um, just on the screening, I, I, I think one has to be very very cautious about thinking that you can screen everywhere. There are a couple of markets, and especially with bid rigging and so on and so forth, where the structure of the price setting in the market is very, very clear. In a lot of other markets, it's very, very hard to do a screening of that type, and I think even in some of the retail markets uh, that you're looking at. So as a general proposal of doing it everywhere, I'm, I'm not really convinced, and when the commission, European Commission tried it, it really fa failed because you couldn't make an inference that was, that was good. So, so you need secondary information uh, for the inference that very often comes from the price setting structure. Now you have that in financial markets, you have that in bid rigging, uh, but in other commercial markets, I think I'd be, I'd be very, very cautious um, and, and would ask myself, so what would actually be the criteria uh, for uh, knowing that you should be starting to intervene? Can I quickly follow up on this uh, screening and monitoring? I, uh, Joe and both Joe and uh, Romy had done a lot of work on this, um, and I think I made a similar point in, uh, in an article uh, called "Cartel uh, Cartel Detection Monitoring: A Look Forward," uh, making the point that there's almost an interesting paradox of doxy here because AI. We're talking about AI uh, being this evil colluders, but at the same time, I do think that. There's a lot of potential for the AI technology to help us detect and uh, monitor the markets. And you know, subject to uh, Kai Yui's uh, uh, comments on, you know, it's not always you can apply uh, those techniques. I'd like to move on to a few questions from the audience. We've actually gotten quite a few. Um, I think this one actually um, plays nicely off of the comments that um, that I just made. The question asks. Um, at what point or, or how should the agencies think about setting the balance between antitrust enforcement in this area and um, not deterring innovation or additional um, sort of innovative competition? Would anyone like to start us off? Maurice. Yeah, so one, one thing I, I, mean, I, I really think there's four prongs to respond to, to that. And the first thing that I think came out from I think everyone on this panel would agree, is to better understand the risks. And that's why I think these market studies and the like are really helpful. And also speaking with the people that are promoting this. I mean, for example, the Italian Competition Authority observed, quote, a number of specialized software developers offer solutions that allow even small companies to implement strategic dynamic pricing strategies, offering tools to auto detect pricing wars as well as to help drive prices back up across all competition. So I think that that's one. Second is improvements in tools to detect collusion. You've already heard one proposal here. Other proposals include auditing the um, algorithm. There are pros and cons involved with that. We, may, um, we promote the algorithm collusion incubator, but then there's also the market studies. The third thing, and I think this is key, is refining the tools for merger enforcement. Um, that Bruce mentioned that that's going to be one of the primary mechanisms to target tacit collusion, and to get a better handle on this. And then, I mean, the other thing that's coming out through this hearing is that the United States has a market power problem, and we're seeing increased concentration in many industries, market power, and the like. Some dispute the evidence, but all the evidence seems to be pointing in that direction. And to the extent that's true, to what extent does not only affect then um, algorithmic collusion, but also maybe perhaps switching the presumption in mergers 
For example, that if you have highly concentrated industries, there's ready legislation now on the Hill, that the uh, presumption would be um, changed. And we propose that as well in our effective competition standard paper. And then the final way, so far we've been talking about ways to deter and detect collusion. Another way to think about this is, are there other mechanisms to destabilize tacit collusion? For example, regu you know, industries that have high entry barriers because of regulatory restraints and the like. And other jurisdictions are now experimenting, for example, with the speed in which um, companies can change um, um, pricing. There may be pros and cons. That's why I think the algorithmic collusion incubator could be helpful. But then also, what about on the consumer side? Is there ways that you can reduce price transparency to the buyer's advantage? So for example, offering reverse bids and giving buyers call options on multiple sellers to help stabilize, destabilize tacit collusion. So the thing is, I'm driving for a gas station. I could then put in an app to the multiple gas stations, what's the best price you can offer me? And now I will know the price, but not necessarily um, my rivals. Would anyone else like to comment? No. I'll move to um, another set of questions just in the remaining few minutes that we have um, from the audience. We've gotten a couple questions on this point, and I think it relates nicely to some of the conversations yesterday on the consumer protection side and also to, um, to I, your comments about the level of technical expertise or understanding that might be necessary to address um, these issues. So yesterday on the consumer protection side, it was suggested that the FTC should um, consider hiring as many technologists as lawyers and that we really do need a much more robust technical understanding to be able to address these issues. We've gotten a couple of similar questions from the audience um, asking about the impact of um, the fact that many of the algorithms are proprietary. Um, what, what the impact of that might be on our ability um, at the antitrust agencies to address um, the types of conduct that we've been discussing on this panel, and also um, the, the, the impact of the extent to which some of the more complex technologies are actually um, explainable or understandable um, to us at the agencies and also to even the companies who are using them. Um, I'd like to see if the panelists have any comments on, on, on any of those topics. Anyone like to start? George Maurice. I would, um, I mean, the first thing I would do is I would go to the ACCC and ask them their experience because they're now hiring um, data specialists on this. And I think it's, you know, look, th you would want to find out what the other agencies are doing to what extent are they using data technology and then data technologies and then to what extent can you use them then effectively both for behavioral discrimination, price discrimination, as well as collusion and other issues that may, may arise as well. I think you definitely need that expertise going into a data-driven economy. Anyone else? Rosa. My experience in uh, these financial and commodities markets have been telling me that often and, and a lot of these include um, relate to spoofing schemes, all sorts of pricing algorithms that regulators are very, very much behind um, everything else that is, is ongoing. Um, I, and, and it is hard to keep up with somebody who just does that every day, every single minute of the day and invents new ways of adjusting prices all of the time. So I don't think I would have ever the expectation that um, the agencies would be able to be monitoring all of these aspects from everybody all of the time and know all of the technologies. I do think, though, that they should have some of that knowledge in-house, and wherever the suspicion does come from whatever source that happens, that a particular pricing algorithm um, may be um, causing um, problems, anti-competitive effects, then I do think the agencies need to have that knowledge to get into there, and even if these are proprietary, obviously having the authority to go review and have their own experts with them. I don't think, though, that this would be something, again, that would be feasible to do or even desirable.
the amount of costs at the firm level to be able to keep up with this kind of regulatory um, um, uh, oversight would be very large. Um, but I think that occasionally that may well be justified and so that expertise would be needed. Anyone else have any comments on that? So maybe, maybe just a quick comment. So uh, I do think that the first line of defense, uh, the first line of uh, 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 the information source should be the developers themselves, the, f the companies who adopt those technology. Um, you know, being in the research uh, community myself, I mean, every time I, I could write a very technical article with all the mathematics, you know, simulation behind, but I always want to make it easier, make it easy to read, have a very easy to read abstract and conclusion. So I do think you know, that's the first place that agencies, uh, anybody with, without uh, technical training, sh should go to. Um, and after that, uh, I, gr I echo what Maurice and uh, uh, Joe's proposal. Uh, I think after that, you know, to really understand how the algorithm behave, um, you probably will need to have, uh, uh, you know, simulations, uh, experiments, um, and uh, research uh, after that. Uh, I actually think there's there's another aspect to this which is is very important to actually have some people with expertise, which which is really checks and balances issue. Um, you very often get if you're you know if you're a competition expert but not an expert in the other things, everything you see, you interpret as a competition problem, uh, and that's often not appropriate to the things that you're seeing. But the reason why you're interpreting it in that way is that you're not understanding the rest of the framework. And so I I, I everywhere where we've seen economists come in, patent lawyers come in, the agencies and so on. I think we've had a much more, more differentiated and broader view. Um, in the end, I think that also enhances enforcement because it enhances the distinction between something that's problematic and something that's unproblematic. And especially something like collusion where the important thing of policy is giving the right incentives. Right? It's really important that you punish things that are for sure bad because if you're punishing things that might not be bad, you're actually reducing the incentive effects of what you're, what you're doing. So, so I think just from that perspective of kind of distinguishing and having the perspective of saying, oh, but this is also relevant for X, with ha which has nothing to do for, for competition, just that big picture item is something that's, that's, I think, of critical importance if one is engaging, even if it's not replicating the, the algorithms that, that one is looking at. With that, we're over time, so I ask you to please join me in thanking our panelists for an interesting session. Now we have a, a short break. Yeah.